year in review. U.S. Catholic bishops approve a new teaching document on the Eucharist. Lasting legacy. Archbishop Salvador Cordilio considers the impact of the vote on the life of the church. Global mission. Join us for a trip to the International Eucharistic Congress in Budapest. children's show. See how a group of Catholic converts uses music to evangelize to a young audience. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, December 30th, 2021. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable, and tonight we bring you a year in review special. Over the next 30 minutes, we want to show you some of the biggest topics that we have covered and take a look back at some of our favorite stories. We begin with a highly anticipated vote at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. They overwhelmingly decided to approve a teaching document about the importance of the Eucharist in the life of the church. Correspondent Mark Irons provided this report from the bishops' meeting in Baltimore. U.S. bishops unify over a statement focused on giving clear teaching about the Eucharist. At their annual meeting in Baltimore, the body of bishops overwhelmingly approved a statement called The Mystery of the Eucharist in the Life of the Church. We spoke with bishops who told us about the importance of clarifying church teaching. We need to listen to the Word of God and to venerate Him present in the bread and the wine. It's about, about uh, coming closer to Christ and, and, uh, and helping our people come to appreciate the, the, the great gift that the Eucharist is. During their June meeting, about 75% of the bishops supported an initial Lord, drafting Lord, of the teaching Lord, document on the Eucharist, but 55 bishops voted against it, some expressing concerns it would attempt to deny some public officials communion. Today, only eight bishops voted against approving the document. The document is not about politics, it's about the Eucharist. Before the final vote today, various amendments to the document were proposed. Earlier this week, Bishop Joseph Strickland of Tyler, Texas, told us he wanted to emphasize the need to approach the Eucharist with a repentant heart and confession. He said that applies not just to public officials, but all people who may oppose church teaching. Whatever walk of life, if you are adamantly opposing what the church teaches, that has to be addressed before you approach the Eucharistic altar. Today, the bishops took up a number of other action items, approving the USCCB 2022 budget and voting to update the conference's socially responsible investment guidelines. The bishops also authorized a review of their charter for the protection of children and young people, a document focused on fighting clergy sex abuse. We would expect that the review would take into consideration learnings from the McCarrick Report, other current events in the life of the church, and societal trends that present challenges for maintaining a safe environment. The bishops also approved a National Eucharistic Congress today. The big event is scheduled for 2024 in Indianapolis. It's all part of the bishops' effort to create a revival centered around the Eucharist. In Baltimore, Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. And joining me now to discuss this is Archbishop Salvador Cordillon from the Archdiocese of San Francisco. Your Excellency, welcome back. So great to see you. Uh, first off, I'd like to get your reaction to the vote. And also, could you give us some insight into those discussions that you all have had in regards to the document? Well, the document has uh, matured over time. It was somewhat restructured and uh, someone amplified. The document we were presented to vote on for this meeting was only minor really changes were made to it. There was a real sense of consensus and cohesion around this document. One point that was brought up was giving more emphasis to the connection between the Eucharist and, and the poor and all kind of vulnerable, marginalized people. This, of course, is very ancient in our tradition. Uh, all the saints, St. John Chrysostom in particular, has uh, preached very forcefully about that. The Eucharist requires us to care for the poor, up to Pope Benedict XVI and his encyclical uh, Sacramentum Caritatis. He emphasizes this sacrament of love 
of charity causes to care for the poor. So that was given more emphasis. And then there were a few other little sort of tweaks made here and there. But the document that the Doctrine Committee uh, produced was accepted uh, very robustly, very uh, uh, gratefully by all of the bishops. So to me, it demonstrates that the process works. The, the committee drafted an original document. They consulted the various pertinent commi other committees of the conference. All of the bishops had an opportunity to submit modifications in advance of this meeting. The document was somewhat restructured from the original one, and what ended up being produced is a very beautiful and I think well-balanced document uh, that will be very valuable for our teaching about uh, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and what it means to be properly disposed to receive him in the Eucharist. Yeah, and I'm wondering, how important do you think this is? The importance is now to be determined. What is important is how this document is implemented in the diocese and around the country and the, uh, what, what is actually done with it. We're seeing this as sort of the doctrinal basis of the other Eucharistic project we have going on now, Eucharistic Revival. So this is a teaching document, so the doctrinal basis for this multi-year, three-year process of celebrating the Eucharist and rekindling Eucharistic devotion and love at the diocesan parish level, culminating in a, in a grand uh, national event, a Euchar uh, National Eucharistic Congress. So what, how important is it? is to be determined, but I see it as having great potential as the doctrinal basis of this Eucharistic revival process and as a great resource for bishops in their diocese. And I understand uh, later today the bishops will also vote on if there should be uh, a National Eucharistic Congress in 2024. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, we actually, uh, miraculously enough, ended our morning agenda early, <laughs> so we're able to move that up from the afternoon agenda to the morning. So we just ended our morning session with that uh, agenda item. The uh, idea is that we would begin on a diocesan level with uh, with Corpus Christi processions next year, July 19th of next year, and that would, would launch this Eucharistic revival process. And then uh, we would have uh, Eucharistic missionaries, preachers to preach in, in dioceses at uh, diocesan convocations, convocations of priests, other way, however bishops want to utilize them in their diocese. You can call upon them, they'll be all around the country. Then a parish celebration the following year, and then again culminating in this National Eucharistic Congress that will take place in Indianapolis. The importance of the Eucharist also took center stage at a September gathering in Europe. Our crews traveled to the capital of Hungary for the International Eucharistic Congress. EWTN News Rome correspondent Colin Flynn joins us now from Budapest. Colin, great to see you. Uh, so tell us, what has the Congress been like so far? Good evening, Tracy, from the Expo Conference Hall here in Budapest. And although this is the location of the week-long Congress, it actually started on Sunday, around 20 minutes from here, in Hero Square in the center of Budapest. It was a beautiful day. The sun was shining down as thousands of people from all over Hungary gathered together to celebrate Mass. Also, over a thousand young people made their first Holy Communion. Now, there are many workshops and talks across the week here, but the main mission of the Congress is, of course, to strongly emphasize that core teaching and belief that Catholics hold, which is that Christ is truly present in the Eucharist. And can you talk about who some of the speakers are and the people taking part in this Eucharistic Congress? Yes, that's the great thing about this event, Tracy, which was postponed, of course, for a year because of COVID, is that you see the great universality of the Catholic Church. Walking around over the past few days, I've been meeting cardinals and bishops and priests and sisters from literally all over the world. And I suppose it is hoped that by coming together, we can share our different experiences, methods and ways of how best to proclaim the message of the gospel and the Eucharist. And during the week, there is a theological symposium, personal testimonies from church leaders, concerts, and talks on topics like peace and reconciliation and healing. Many of the speakers have been coming back to that topic again and again. How to use the Eucharist to help the suffering in the world, suffering from the pandemic, also the situation in Afghanistan and other areas of unrest. In fact, one of the key speakers today was Cardinal Louis Rafael Sacco from Baghdad. He gave a fascinating talk about how to separate religion and politics in Iraq, 
what the Pope visit meant to the country earlier this year and why he believes the Eucharist can bring unity to the Church. No, I think, you know, the Eucharist is this, the heart of our faith. And there are many messages, you know. In our liturgy, we call uh, Eucharist the sacraments of sacraments. Coming up, our Year in Review special continues with a look back at 9-11. How the 20th anniversary of the attacks is remembered by those who experienced the terror firsthand. And remembering the victims. Family members reflect on the sacrifice made to save others. Welcome back to our EWTN News Nightly Year in Review special. I'm Tracy Sable. In September, we took time to reflect on the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. More than 180 people died when American Airlines Flight 77 slammed into the Pentagon. Correspondent Eric Rosales spoke with witnesses. You are hearing audio from first responders and air traffic control on the day of the attack. White House has been advised. All right, I'll tell them. Yeah. The city, just north of Crystal City. Just to the north of your town. Just Give that. Yeah, I'll stop all departures. Stop all. Yeah, it went in the Pentagon. Looks like it went in the Pentagon. In the moments inside the hallway, burning to death seemed to last an eternity. Lieutenant Colonel Brian Birdwell, now a Texas state senator, never thought a trip to the restroom would save his life. On the second floor of the Pentagon's outer E-ring, his office was in Flight 77's path. Birdwell was engulfed in flames. Parts of his polyester army pants melted to his skin. Burned over 60%, it took Birdwell more than four years and countless surgeries to recover. My, you know, my ears are artificial, my eye sockets have been rebuilt, my forehead. And then banked up 395, and I was just maybe a mile and a half up that highway, sitting in that traffic jam next to the, to the Pentagon. Gary Bauer, president of the conservative organization American Values, witnessed the plane collide with the Pentagon. I didn't know it then, but I would find out later that at that very moment, friends of mine uh, died both as passengers on that plane and also at their desk in, in the Pentagon. Two lives of many impacted that day. Since then, the Pentagon has been rebuilt, stronger, and a memorial stands at the site of the impact. If you've ever visited the Pentagon, you know about the 9-11 memorial that sits outside. But inside the Pentagon, in the E-ring, which was in the direct path of the plane, sits a more intimate memorial for America's heroes who died that day. The memorial is built right next to the chapel. The walls covered in metal similar to the inside of a plane. Etched in stone, the names of those lost. On one side sits a purple heart. On the other, the Defense of Freedom Medal. A book showcasing the lives of those lost, along with another filled with messages of hope and prayers. On the way to the memorial, quilts sent by Americans line the hallway. This country is made great and kept great by the exertions of citizens who love this country and love their freedoms. Both State Senator and, Brian and Birdwell and Gary Bauer hope the 9-11 attacks will never be forgotten, especially with America's security challenges growing. And at the same time all that is happening, uh, among American young people, we are at the lowest levels of patriotism in modern American history. A history they hope won't repeat itself. At the Pentagon, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Edward Fount was among the 40 passengers and crew members who died when Flight 93 crashed into a field near Shanksville, Pennsylvania on 9-11. Now, two decades later, Fount's brother Gordon tells correspondent Owen Jensen how he was able to move forward after his brother's death. Gordon Felt telling me about his brother Edward. Ed was a, just a generous, gentle brilliant man uh, who loved nothing more than his family. And Gordon, who I interviewed earlier this week at the Flight 93 Memorial, says if his brother were here... I'll give him a big hug first. 
The passengers and crew members of Flight 93, of course, had family and friends and futures to look forward to. But then came the morning of September 11, 2001. Fast forward 20 years and visitors to this memorial and generations of Americans to come will see their names etched in stone and learn the story of how they fought back against evil. Flight 93 National Memorial Superintendent Steve Clark says over 400,000 visitors arrive here every year. But when they come and they really experience these 2,200 acres, the Tower of Voices, the Visitor Center, and of course the Wall of Names, it, it just really empowers them and they walk away with a much clearer understanding of what happened on 9-11 and what those 40 people were faced with and ultimately what they were able to accomplish by thwarting the attack on Washington, D.C. That's where this plane was heading. Gene Callahan, a first-time visitor, thinks of all the years of life they still had yet to live. People like Lauren Catuzzi Grancolis, who died along with her unborn child. It comes back. I mean, you remember all these poor people were on that plane and everything and the destruction. And it is something that makes you really think back at how quick your life can change and the whole world can change. And Paige Grogan, also visiting the memorial, was just a toddler on 9-11. You feel touched, basically, when you leave here. Like, you come thinking, like, you're just going to see, like, this field with everything. But then you feel, like, different when you leave. When you walk these hallowed grounds, your eyes are immediately drawn to this. As Gordon explains, it's where the struggle for the cockpit ended. The boulder is marks the, the impact site where the plane came down. We're, we're standing here at the edge of the flight path. Uh, by the time the plane was, was just about to come down over our heads here, it was inverted, traveling just under 600 miles an hour uh, at the end of a battle uh, that our loved ones waged to try to retake control of the plane. The sheer horror of that extremely violent day is hard to fathom in what is now such a peaceful, quiet setting surrounded by beautiful nature, breezy sunshine, and soft clouds. Gordon says his brother's spirit guides him. Uh, you know, I think if I had a chance to talk to Ed at the moment, I'd, I'd talk to him about his family, how proud I am of his wife, his children, uh, how they've been able to honor him and, and respect him and, and move forward with their lives. And Gordon tells me he could not have moved forward without his faith. For me, there was never anger at God at all. Uh, he lifts us up. He supports me. Um, the anger was directed at humanity, uh, at terrorists uh, that for some reason thought that making a political statement by murdering thousands of people was going to get them something. And on this day, at the Flight 93 Memorial, chalk artists create portraits of the lives taken, capturing their smiles and humanity and what could have been. In Shanksville, Pennsylvania, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Up next, faith in politics. How one lawmaker shares why he reaches for the Bible now more than ever. And it's more than singing and dancing. How the wonderful world of Benjamin Cello seeks to draw children closer to God. We also like to show you the convergence of faith and politics. Representative Ben Klein went from being a staff member to becoming a U.S. congressman himself. And through it all, the Virginia Republican says his Catholic faith kept him disciplined. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. Growing up in the small town of Lexington, Virginia, U.S. Congressman Ben Klein says he could never have imagined the journey God had for his life. He says it's an honor to represent the 6th District of Virginia, a district he says wants him to continue to fight for what the Constitution represents. I wear my views on my sleeve. I'm, I'm very blunt sometimes uh, to my own detriment politically, but I don't hesitate to stand up in my town hall meetings when someone challenges my pro-life positions and say, that's, that's my faith, that's the way I was raised, I'm pro-life. I'll continue to be pro-life and I'll continue to make it a priority. A former altar boy at St. Patrick's Parish in Lexington, Congressman Klein tells me besides his family, a number of priests and parishioners have poured into his life. Even today, he surrounds himself with fellow believers, like Catholic Congressman Alex Mooney of West Virginia. 
as he and others are involved in the annual National Prayer Breakfast. I quickly realized that this place challenges your faith every day, not just on issues related to abortion funding, but uh, just the um, animosity and the vitriol between the parties. You really do have to uh, fall back on your faith uh, on a regular basis. Congressman Klein says it's a job he cannot do without the support of his family. His wife Elizabeth and two nine-year-old twin daughters keep him grounded along with the Word of God, which he reads from his well-used Confirmation Bible given to him by his grandparents. And the Bible is one that I have reached for more often uh, as this year and, and the past uh, two years of my tenure have gone. A highlight of his congressional career, a bipartisan trip to Israel to learn about the history and politics. Uh, being at the Sea of Galilee, uh, being at the place where uh, Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, you know, that's my favorite Bible verse in, in Matthew 5. And, and so uh, it was really a, an amazing opportunity. Congressman Klein tells me when his time here on earth is done and he stands before the Lord, he hopes to hear what Jesus told the disciples on the Sermon on the Mount, that God blesses the humble and they will inherit the whole world. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. After being rejected by secular media companies, a children's show hopes to spread the gospel in a new and tuneful way. The wonderful world of Benjamin Cello is now in its second season, and the people behind the show have a unique story of creativity and conversion. Correspondent Mark Irons reports. The actors, we might illuminate the night, and actresses bringing this colorful children's show to life all have a common mission, and they're all related. It's quite the family affair. Over the last two decades, the Wolliver family has made a name for themselves as the Annie Moses Band. Oh God, my father. In 2019, they decided to take their musical talent from stage to screen with the faith-filled production of The Wonderful World of Benjamin Cello, created by Robin Wolliver, the mother of this musical clan. She noticed how many Disney songs her grandchildren knew and how few hymns. She says the time children spend in front of screens can be influential. And we have got to meet that. And we must saturate our children in truth. When the family first started creating Benjamin Cello, there were challenges. Industry professionals wanted references to God in the show to be removed before funding the project. The Wolvers wouldn't do that. After being rejected by multiple secular streaming services, the family made the decision to move out to the Tennessee countryside build their own studio, and create their own media company. We um, have had so much fun, though. You know, God is so amazing. It's not the first major transition this group has been through. Years ago, as they traveled the world playing music, they made another move that was life-changing. This whole family of Protestants converted to Catholicism. It was really just a God, a move of God. Each member had different experiences that brought them closer to the Catholic faith. For Benjamin Wolliver, seen with his cello on screen, it was the writings of the saints. And as a Protestant, he says he was familiar with the Catholic Church, but experiencing God's love in the sacraments was something he could not articulate until he converted. What I tried to communicate to people, it's like trying to imagine a symphony when you've only heard a few fiddles. You know, you, you just have to really have the Holy Spirit open your mind to something greater than you could have imagined. And it's that imagination coming to life in the world of Benjamin Cello, finding a fresh way to spread the gospel. The show can be streamed on Right Now Media and Formed. Remember, God loves you. We hope to, in everything we do, create that sense of wonder that makes people grateful for what God's given them, for who he is, who he's created us to be. In Washington, Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. And thank you for watching our Year in Review special for the entire EWTN News Nightly team. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.